we have gathered because we wish to be part of your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. Be with us, we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Please join the praise team this morning, unplugged. Our tiny little praise team today. <laughs> um, <laughs> Beth and Jordan and I are going to get us started on a couple songs. So the words are on the screen. Uh, we ask you to please sing along and uh, stand if you are able. Draw me close.
great job, everyone. If you will please join me in the call to celebration. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe that God is the Spirit, that we worship God with truth we believe that God is light, and that if we walk in the light, we have true fellowship with one another. We believe that God is love, and that we are children of God, receiving the spirit of forgiveness and reconciliation, encouraging all to share with God's kingdom. Please join me for the opening hymn, Be Thou My Vision, 451.
It should be. <laughs> I'm not sure if there's other children with us today, but if they would work their way forward, if I miss them. Any other kids with us? Come on down front, please. Well, guys, it looks like it's just us. And the two of you have the correct colors on, yes. and I have different colors on, because I didn't plan very well. But that's OK. You know what I've been doing this week? Taking lights down. Yeah. How many of us have been putting away Christmas things? In fact, we here at the church have just a few more things to put away. But I've been spending a lot of the week putting lights down. And I was reminded about how Christmas lights work. Ready? They're all lit, aren't they? Or are they? Huh? What do you think? They're all still lit? Okay, good, good. What happens to Christmas lights, though, some of them, whenever one goes out? Sometimes they do, don't they? Look at right there. You see another one that's out? Sometimes they stay on. But what happens whenever Christmas lights and one of them comes out. A whole line of them went out, didn't it? Stopped working. You know, taking and putting Christmas lights away this year, I had a lot of them that didn't quite work. And I caught myself thinking about us here at the church, where every once in a while, one of us has kind of a bad experience or a bad time. And if we're good at it, we can be a church that says, okay, even though that one's having trouble, the rest can stay lit and help that one. But sometimes we miss somebody that it affects and it hurts a lot of us, doesn't it? So I wanted to remind us this year after Christmas that we want to be a church that even whenever one person has a problem, the rest of, the rest of us stay lit and, and surround that person in fact, whenever we kind of gather together, you can't even tell that that person's really having a problem, can you? So I just thought I'd make a parable out of Christmas lights today. It's not in the Bible, but I thought it would be a great reminder to us that when we see one of us hurting or not as bright as we used to be, we need to help them and stay lit ourselves. Amen? Let's pray for a moment. I ask your special blessing upon these gentlemen here that are with us this day, Lord, and all the children that are unable to be here today, and the children in our community and around the world. Help them to get a little glimpse of your light this day and always. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys, for coming up and for wearing the right colors. <laughs> Jan, would you please? Please join me in the prayer hymn. You may re remain seated while you sing this. 128. In your hymn.
As we spend time in prayer together this morning, I invite you to share the joys and concerns that are on your hearts with the community, and we will hold you up by saying, Lord, hear our prayer. What joys and concerns do you have this morning? I just got a text message that my grandmother was rushed to the hospital with the flu. So she's in the emergency room right now. This is the gram that I do all the crafts with that you all see me on Facebook with. So just keep her in your prayers. We lift up you and your grandmother. Lord, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayers. Are there others? We have two nieces who have cancer. One is doing pretty well. She's had breast surgery and is recovering, Candace. But our other niece, Widget, we call her Widget, but she's really Janice. <laughs> Widget's struggling with chemo, and they have three children, each with a disability, and Widget's the caregiver. So kindly pray for that family. We lift up your nieces and their families. Lord, hear our, our prayer. prayers. Before you move on, Matt, I think we need to point out that Nancy and Bob have been on another continent for the last month, mm -hmm. and it's nice to have them back. So a prayer of celebration, gang. Richard, it's good to have you back with us safely. You're here. It is a joy. Lord, hear our prayer. Our prayer. There is a long list of names and circumstances that's in the bulletin every week, and it's there so that during the week you could remember those individuals in your thoughts and in your prayers. Let us continue. If ask Jan if she would lead us in our unison prayer today, please. In your bulletin, Almighty God, we recognize that our differences are many, and yet we continually find that our hopes our fears and our aspirations are often very similar. We express our sorrow today for the mists of fear, envy, hatred, suspicions, and greed, which have blinded our care for others. And we pray that thy spirit would shed light upon our hearts and our minds, enabling the journeys we share to be guided in the pathways of faithful fellowship and fruitful peace. Amen. O oh, eternal God, we thank you for those of our time who are open to the inspirations of your spirit, following their hearts and seeking and helping us to cleanse ourselves from old prejudice, to find new ways to cross over old boundaries of differences and disagreements into a promised land of more goodwill and peaceful responses. Lord, forgive us for holding prejudice to the past and often judging others with narrow positions of our own views or from rumors passed down or passed on. It is so easy to hold hostilities, Lord, and suspicions, leading us to such distrust. Why is it, Lord, do we often magnify the faults of others and ignore the offenses of our own? Lord, help us in the midst of the realities of our world today, threatened by war and famine in areas of our world. Nuclear destruction is now part of a daily conversation differences of people because of race or political preferences or promises. Too often we find the influence of governments of this world that help to lead that disunity. Lord, we pray that may our leaders of our nation and others seek ways to speak a common language, to get past the differences and the hostilities and to say things that can model and proclaim the possibilities of being together. Lord, within our own church, this denomination with such a wonderful history and past has those moments as well that need to find forgiveness. Be with our congregation 
and our denomination. Help us both to continue to find and to seek ways of supporting so many others, to share the messages of Christmas time throughout this coming year, messages of hope and of love, expressions of peace and the opportunities to share goodwill. So Lord, in our moments of prayer, we pause now because we wish to seek to listen to your prayers, to guide, to nurture, to strengthen us. Lord, help us to listen as you pray. As the disciples pleaded some time ago, we still seek to find the words when it's our turn to pray. Lord, help us to pray together this moment, but in every moment. Please join me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. Just a few quick reminders. If you are on our trustees, we were trying to gather today, but we may not have enough, but let's try Anyway, after worship, we'll meet in the parlor briefly. We have a number of things to take a look at over the next couple of months that we want to get before you, if possible, today. Our staff parish relations committee will meet next Sunday after church as well. But today, I really wanted to celebrate something, even though we're small in number this morning, we still have a lot to give thanks for on the back of your bulletin. There is a chart that we often use and will continue to use throughout the coming year. It shows how we finished the year. I stood in this pulpit over the past two months sharing the wonderful blessing of being able to state that all of our gifts for the month of December were being matched. And then for Christmas Eve and the last week of the year, Anything that came in for 2018 was also going to be matched. As you can see in this chart, our congregation has truly been blessed. I have served at least 10 different congregations as the pastor, and I have never been able to see this type of gifting and the ability of a congregation to really work together. I want to affirm and thank you. And, of course, you'll hear more about this perhaps in the weeks to come. But you can do the math. The bottom lines are quite impressive. Calvary United Methodist Church has a lot to be thankful for, and I thank you. Let us continue now to share those gifts, those ties, and those offerings.
Please stand. God, we give you thanks for your generosity towards us, and we ask that you would continue to inspire us to be generous with one another. Use these gifts to build your kingdom in this church, in this city, and in our world. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today is a day whenever we think of Martin Luther King Jr. It's a day whenever we give thanks for the abilities in our communities to grow and to be supportive of one another. It's also a day where we want to give the choir a break. So they've worked very hard over the past number of months. But it was also a day where we thought, oh, okay, we still have to have some sort of music. So you'll have to bear with me. I haven't done this for months. But I thought I would bring a little gift. And Jordan's joining me this morning, as I said, unplugged with guitars this day. And it's a song that one of my mentors with guitar playing uh, shared for many years. And it's captured by one of the basic needs to build a community, as Martin Luther King Jr. would say, to build a congregation, as John Wesley would say. And it takes people that are willing to be a friend. So this is more of a statement not about me, but about us and how Calvary can be a friend to people everywhere and at all times. When you're down and troubled and you need a helping hand and nothing, oh, nothing is going right. Close your eyes and think of me, and soon I will be there to brighten up even your darkest night. I'll just call out my name And you know wherever I am I'll come running To see you again Winter, spring, summer, or fall all you got to do is call and i'll be there yeah 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 you've got a friend when the sky is above you they turn dark and full of clouds And that old north wind begins to blow Keep your head together And just call my name out loud And soon I'll be a knocking upon your door. 
just call out my name and you know wherever I am I'll come running to see you again whether winter spring summer or fall all you got to do is call and I'll be there yeah yeah yes hey ain't it good to know that you've got a friend cause people can be so cold they'll hurt you and desert you well I take your soul if you let them oh now don't you let them so just call out my name and you know wherever I am I'll come running to see you again whether it's a winter spring summer or fall all I got to do is call and I'll be there yeah yeah got a friend you got a friend good to know good to know you got a We've had the opportunity throughout Christmas to hear from the Gospels of Matthew and from Luke in particular, but today we turn to the fourth Gospel, the Gospel of John. Jan, would you please? John 1, 43 through 51. And Jesus calls Philip and Nathanael. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethesda the city of, of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said to him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe before believe I told you that I saw you under the fig tree you will see greater things from these and he said to him very truly I tell you you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man the words of God written by the people of God for the people of God thanks be to God Before I begin this morning, I wanted to just let you know that Natalie and I have reached the point in her pregnancy where when I leave, I don't say goodbye. I say, call me if you go into labor. Uh, so I have pulled my phone out and set it here. It would be an early labor, but just in case, I'm going to have my phone here. I hope that's okay. <laughs> it's always a, it's a little bit stressful being away from her for these last couple weeks of, of this. But anyway... I have a, uh, a little poll that I wanted to take real quick. I'm going to put you all on the spot for a moment, if you will indulge me. It involves raising your hand. So raise your hand if you have invited someone new to church in the last year. Think back. All right, now keep your hand up if you have invited someone new to church in the last month. 
Now, Christmas was within a month, so anybody, if you invited anybody on Christmas Eve, that counts, so that's a little bit of a cheat. All right, now keep your hand up if you've invited someone new to church in the last week. We got some stars out there. All right, what about the last 24 hours? Anybody? That would be amazing. So I uh, have a two-part role here at Calvary. The first is that I coordinate the young adult ministry, and uh, that's been really exciting. And if there's any young adults out there, uh, you should see me after church because we have a gathering on Thursday. But the other part of my role that you, you might have noticed is membership development. And a piece of that responsibility is thinking about how we bring new people into this community and how we get them involved in the life of the congregation. And that starts with some sort of invitation, probably from one of you to someone you care about, inviting someone to be part of what we're doing here. So this morning, I wanted to use the text from the Gospel of John to look at the idea of invitation, to ask ourselves two questions. One are we inviting people to be part of this community through our words and also through how we live? And two, what exactly is it that we're inviting people to? Because I think it's more than just a service on Sunday morning that we would like to invite people to be part of. We heard this story this morning about the calling of a, of a few of the disciples. And John, the Gospel of John, focuses in on Nathaniel, a disciple who doesn't get much attention in the Gospels otherwise, and there's even some discrepancies on what exactly his name was. So anyway, Nathaniel does get a moment of glory here in the Gospel of John. And I've always been really fascinated by the calling stories in general because there's something that inspired these people to drop everything to risk everything they had, to lose things that mattered to them in order to follow Jesus of Nazareth. And I like that Nathaniel, in particular, receives his initial invitation secondhand. Jesus says to Philip, follow me. And then Philip, as excited as he is, goes and finds Nathaniel and brings him along. If there isn't an, an example of what we should be doing as Christians, it's Philip. Nathaniel responds with, with a question that, frankly, has been on my mind a lot reading the newspaper this week. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? The implication being that no one of worth could come from a hole like that. Can't the Messiah come from somewhere nice like Jerusalem? But Jesus came from Nazareth. He came from a place like that, and every person in every town and every country on every continent in our world has inherent worth and dignity as a child of God and be, should be treated as such. But I'm digressing a little bit. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? In his reply to Nathaniel's question, Philip gives us a framework for how we might invite people not to, just to come to church, but to experience Christ's love and mercy in their lives. Come and see, Philip says. Come and see. That is the fundamental invitation of discipleship. Come and see. It seems simple enough, but I think that we often as Christians miss the truth of this invitation and the depth of what this says. Come and see. Author Shane Claiborne talks about coming across a street preacher in his hometown of Philly, and I'm sure we're all well aware of the type. He, the street preacher was standing on a box with a megaphone screaming. Beside him, he had a coffin with a fake corpse in it, and he warned anyone who could hear that they were going to die and go to hell if they didn't repent of their sin and accept Jesus into their heart. Shane Claiborne says that all he wanted to do in that moment was to get a box and jump up beside this street preacher and yell at the top of his lungs, God is not a monster. The more I have read the Bible and studied the life of Jesus, he writes, the more I have become convinced that Christianity spreads best, not through force, but through fascination. That is what the invitation to come and see is about. It's not coercive or forceful but it invites fascination. 
It reflects the truth. Fascination is what led Nathaniel to discipleship. Fascinated by this person, Jesus, who Philip had told him about. Fascination is what we use when we invite people to participate in the church today. Come and see is our invitation. But come and see can be misconstrued as come and consume. We have seen churches take that a little bit too literally. Come and see meaning come and observe. Churches that offer worship as entertainment to be consumed in the same way we watch sporting events or binge our favorite TV shows. Churches that have taken a fast food model of ministry, offering worship and programs that are initially satisfying but offer little sustenance and can actually be detrimental to our spiritual health. Come and see is not come and consume. We are inviting people to something different to come and see. If Nathaniel's response shows us anything, it's that there was something deeper to the invitation, something transformative, something fascinating. So we're in the season of Epiphany, and I think Nathaniel's response shows us that the invitation to come and see was an invitation to have an Epiphany, to have his eyes opened to the world in a new and transformative way. Epiphanies tend to transform people because once we have seen, seen our epiphany, we know that we can't go back to living as we once did. This is seen in Nathaniel's change after he came and saw as Philip invited him to do. We're thinking about Reverend Dr. King this weekend a lot, and there's a story about his epiphany in his book, Stride Toward Freedom, so I'd like to read an excerpt of that this morning. I was ready to give up. With my cup of coffee sitting untouched before me, I tried to think of a way to move out of the picture without appearing a coward. In this state of exhaustion, when my courage had all but gone, I decided to take my problem to God. With my head in my hands bowed over the kitchen table, I prayed aloud. The words I spoke to God that night are still vivid in my memory. I am here taking a stand for what I believe is right, but now I am afraid. The people are looking to me for leadership, and if I stand before them without strength and courage, they too will falter. I am at the end of my powers. I have nothing left. I have come to the point where I can't face it alone. At that moment, he continues, I experienced the presence of the divine as I had never experienced God before. It seemed as though I could hear the quiet assurance of an inner voice saying, stand up for justice, stand up for truth, and God will be at your side forever. Almost at once, my fears began to go. My uncertainty disappeared. I was ready to face anything. Martin Luther King was changed by this epiphany that is often referred to as his vision in the kitchen. He was invited by God's Spirit to come and see, to see a world of justice and equality, and he, what he saw in that invitation left him empowered to stand up for what he knew was right. Thus, the invitation that we offer as members of this community to others is not an invitation to observe, but an invitation to participate. Not an invitation just to see what God is doing, but to contribute to the work of God's kingdom. And that's why I think the invitation to come and see could be really better understood as an invitation to come and be. To come and be. To be a disciple. Faith, following Jesus, is about our being, our very essence, the entirety of who we are down to our very core, body, mind, and spirit, come and be. The question of faith is not, what do you see? The question of faith is, who are you in your very being? To be or not to be? That is the question. See what I did there? (laughs) Shakespeare. But kidding aside, to be 
is the question of faith. To be is what we are inviting people to do as Christians. The invitation of Nathaniel and the invitation to each of us and the invitation that we offer to others is to come and be. To be is the, to recognize God as the source of our being. Theologian Paul Tillich describes God as the ground of being. God's spirit is the very source of our existence and of being itself. So the invitation, come and be, is not about discovering something new. We as a church aren't offering something new that wasn't there for people before. We're offering them an opportunity to recognize something that has been there the entire time at the very center of their being. Come and be. Come and recognize God's presence in the very nature of our existence. As the psalmist writes, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to the heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. Come and be. Come and see God's presence that permeates every part of creation. And when we are invited to come and be, we are invited to the opportunity to recognize God's presence in ourselves, in everyone else, and in everything of creation. But before my existential ramblings get way out of hand, the invitation to come and be is about more than just the nature of God's presence in our lives. Come and be is an invitation to come and be the people that God created us to be. So we invite, when we invite people to come and be, we are inviting them first and foremost to come and be themselves. Be the person that God created you to be. We have all found ways for ourselves to flourish in this space, and so when we invite people, it is that they can come as well to be themselves. I think that's why, for many of us, it's so important that our church be outspoken about welcoming our LGBTQ brothers and sisters. We invite them to come and be in the fullness of who they were created to be. And that means celebrating the beauty and diversity of God's creation. Come and be. So often people feel like they have to leave a part of themselves at the door when they come into a church. But we offer a different invitation. Come and be. Come and be yourself. Come and be who God created you to be. Come and be loved. We invite people who are lonely, who are lost, who are in need of love to come and be loved in this space, to experience holy hospitality in this church. And we understand that that doesn't happen automatically. We have to work to love everyone who comes through those doors, to go out of our way to say hello, to welcome folks who are new to our community, to get to know them and to care for them. Our invitation to come and be requires us to work to welcome those we have invited. Come and be loved. And then finally, come and be loved to others. This is the crux of what we're inviting people to. Nathaniel not only met and experienced the love of Jesus, he was invited into discipleship. Invited to be the hands and feet of Christ to the world and agent of God's love. So when we invite people to church, when we invite people to this community, we're inviting them not just to come experience church, but to come and put love into practice as part of our community. To come and to serve. And we recognize that everyone is invited to this path. Everyone is called to be the hands and feet of Christ. Everyone is called to be love. So what we're doing when we say come and be is we're inviting people to a sense of purpose. We're inviting them to the work of the kingdom. And to me, this is where Dr. King's legacy speaks truth to us in an important and timely way. 
So as we think about what we're inviting people to come and be, I wanted to share a video that features an excerpt from one of his sermons. And this is one of my uh, favorite uh, sermons that I've ever heard. But I think it speaks to that a little bit. So I invite you to um, pay attention to the screen for a sec. If you want to be important, wonderful. If you want to be recognized, wonderful. If you want to be great, wonderful. But recognize that he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. That's a new definition of greatness. This morning, the thing that I like about it, by giving that definition of greatness, it means that everybody can be great. Because everybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't know, you don't have to make your subject and your verb agree to serve. You don't have to know about Plato and Aristotle to serve. You don't have to know Einstein's theory of relativity to serve. You don't have to know the second theory of thermodynamics in physics to serve. You only need a heart full of grace. Soul generated by love. You can be that seven. My challenge for you this morning is not just to go out and invite people to church, but to really think about what exactly we have been invited to do as a church and what we are inviting people to do with us. Go out and love others, inviting them to come and be. Our closing hymn this morning is number 555, Forward Through the Ages. Let us stand and sing together.
So if that idea of invitation was too vague or theoretical, I have a real solid invitation that you all join us for lunch following worship today. Come and be downstairs where we can eat and join in fellowship. As we have reflected a little bit on the words of Dr. King, I wanted to leave you with some of his words as a benediction today. Take these words as a source of comfort and of challenge. If you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. Go in peace. Amen.